Welcome to the celebration of Mass for the first Sunday of Lent from Assumption Church in River North, Chicago. Led by the Spirit of our God, we go to fast and pray. With Christ into the wilderness, we join his Paschal way. Rend not your garments, rend your hearts, turn back your lives to me. Thus says our kind and gracious God, whose reign is liberty. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you. And with your spirit. As we continue our journey through Lent, this journey of prayer and fasting and self-giving, let's pause now and acknowledge our sinfulness and ask the Lord of forgiveness to come more deeply into our lives. I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and what I have failed to do, through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore, I ask the Blessed Mary, ever Virgin, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Kyrie eleison, Kyrie eleison, Christ eleison, Christ eleison, Kyrie eleison, Kyrie. Let us pray. Grant, Almighty God, through the yearly observance of Holy Lent, that we may grow in understanding of the riches hidden in Christ and by worthy conduct pursue their effects. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. A reading from the book of Genesis. The Lord God formed man out of the clay of the ground and blew into his nostrils the breath of life, and so man became a living being. Then the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east and placed there the man whom he had formed. Out of the ground the Lord God made various trees grow that were delightful to look at and good for food, with the tree of life in the middle of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now the serpent was the most cunning of all the animals that the Lord God had made. The serpent asked the woman, Did God really tell you not to eat from any of the trees in the garden? The woman answered the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. It is only about the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden that God said, You shall not eat it or even touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You certainly will not die. No, God knows well that the moment you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like gods who know what is good and what is evil. The woman saw that the tree was good for food, pleasing to the eyes and desirable for gaining wisdom. So she took some of its fruit and ate it. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized that they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. The word of the Lord. Be merciful, O Lord, for we have sinned. Have mercy on me, O God, in your goodness. In the greatness of your compassion, wipe out my offense. Thoroughly wash me from my guilt, and of my sin cleanse me. 
Be merciful, O Lord, for we have sinned. For I acknowledge my offense, and my sin is before me always. Against you only have I sinned, and done what is evil in your sight. Be merciful, O Lord, for we have sinned. A clean heart create for me, O God, and a steadfast spirit renew within me. Cast me not out from your presence, and your Holy Spirit take not from me. Be merciful, O Lord, for we have sinned. Give me back the joy of your salvation, and a willing spirit sustain in me. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall proclaim your praise. Be merciful, O God, for we have sinned. A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans. Brothers and sisters, through one man, sin entered the world, and through sin, death, and thus death came to all men, inasmuch as all sinned. For up to the time of the law, sin was in the world, though sin was not accounted when there is no law. But death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who did not sin, after the pattern of the trespass of Adam, who is the type of the one who was to come. But the gift is not like the transgression, for if by the transgression of the one, the many died, how much more did the grace of God and the gracious gift of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow for the many? And the gift is not like the result of the one who sinned. For after one sin, there was the judgment that brought condemnation. But the gift, after many transgressions, brought acquittal. For if, by the transgression of the one, death came to reign through that one, how much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of justification come to reign in life through the one Jesus Christ? In conclusion, just as through one transgression condemnation came upon all, so through one righteous act acquittal and life came to all. For just as the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so through the obedience of the one, the many will be made righteous. The word of the Lord. Thanks. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ, King of endless glory. One does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes forth from the mouth of God. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ, King of endless glory. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. At that time, Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. He fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was hungry. The tempter approached and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become loaves of bread. He said in reply, It is written, One does not live on bread alone but on every word that comes forth from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and made him stand on the parapet of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and with their hands they will support you, lest you dash your foot against a stone. 
Jesus answered him, Again it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Then the devil took him up to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their magnificence. And he said to them, All these I shall give to you, if you will prostrate yourself and worship me. At this Jesus said to him, Get away, Satan. It is written, The Lord your God shall you worship, and him alone shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. The Gospel of the Lord. One of the things that used to puzzle me and maybe puzzle you is in this first reading from the book of Genesis, when the serpent slithers up to Eve and starts talking to her about eating the forbidden fruit, fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The serpent says, if you eat that fruit, it will make you like gods who have the knowledge of good and evil. Well, what's so wrong about that? Aren't we supposed to want to be like God or more like God? Hmm? But the temptation is really very subtle. There's nothing wrong with wanting to be like God. But what Satan, what the serpent was presenting was a false idea of what it means to be like God. What makes God God is not knowledge, but love. And later, God would indeed give commandments and teachings about what was right and wrong, but those commandments grew out of his love, that these commandments were sort of like a recipe for, for the community to live a full and free and happy life, something that Adam and Eve had at the very beginning. Because Adam and Eve had everything they needed for such a life. They just had to be asked to care for the earth, to partner with God and caring for what God had created so that the whole world would reflect the image of the Creator. But Adam and Eve decided to take something that wasn't offered and to decide ultimately for themselves what was right and wrong, to take on this responsibility that really belonged to God, not the creature, to decide what was right and what was wrong. And so this original sin, because it destroyed this original harmony, this original openness between Adam and Eve and the first humans and God, that they became aware of a sense of shame. And the scripture speaks about nakedness, right? So it's not a description of their wardrobe or lack thereof. It was an idea that they had nothing to hide, that everything was transparent and open, right? That Adam and Eve had nothing between them and nobody had anything between the human community and God. Everything was transparent. But this original sin, as St. Paul says in our second reading, echoes down the centuries. And most of these sins that have been committed since then have been similar, taking what's not been offered instead of simply receiving what is offered, deciding for myself what's right and what's wrong. If it's right for me, it's right. And that's led to all of the issues that we deal today, whether it's war or inequality or manipulation or division. It's traveled down the centuries how even we've exploited uh, the earth, which was really meant to be a reflection of God's creation. But here we see Jesus reversing the process. Jesus showing us another way to live. Jesus showed us how to be faithful to the true image of God and to truly reflect God to the world. You know, there's a striking resemblance between, between the temptations that Jesus faced in the desert with the temptation that Adam and Eve faced. On the surface of things, as with the temptation of Adam and Eve, 
the temptation didn't seem like any big deal. It wasn't terribly wrong what Satan was proposing. There's certainly nothing criminal here. He wasn't trying to tempt Jesus to even break one of the commandments. And we can open the newspaper every day or, or dial up our news feed every day and, and read about much worse, much more terrible things that are happening in our city and our world than anything that, that, that Satan was proposing to Jesus. Eh? You think about the people of, of Ukraine who have been suffering now for a year from a war. What's, what is Satan saying? Uh, why don't you jump off the temple and not hurt yourself? Seems like nothing, doesn't it? But it was the same temptation that Adam and Eve faced. It was to embrace a false idea of God and a false idea of what it means to be the Son of God. You see, at Jesus' baptism, this voice rang out, this is my beloved Son. His mission is to reflect God to the world to be this transparent representation of who God is, to restore what was destroyed through the cumulative effects of sin. But notice what Satan does. He starts out each temptation this way. If you are the Son of God, then you'll do this, see? Let me tell you who you are. Let me define your mission for you. Let me tell you what it is to be like God. And you know, it is so important who we allow to tell us who we are. You know, it often defines what we end up doing in life and the kind of life we end up leading. You know, if we are surrounded only by negative people who only tell us when we do something wrong or don't believe in us, probably we're not going to end up doing very much. And you think of a contrast to someone like Mary, the mother of Jesus. She was a young teenager in some podunk town called Nazareth. And an angel comes to her and says, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Now that may be a throwaway line for us in a prayer, but it meant something very special to Mary. She listened to that message. She allowed God to tell her who she was that she had the gift, she had the grace to accomplish what God was asking her to do, and that God would be with her every step of the way. And so she was able to say yes to Gabriel, not because she was qualified, not because she had any credentials to be the mother of God, but because she let God tell her who she was. So who do we allow to tell us who we are? Do we allow God? Or do we allow Satan? Hmm? See, Jesus, in rejecting the temptations and refusing to conform to the false image of God, refuses to let Satan tell him who he was. And he reaffirms his mission, which is also, in its own way, our mission. The first temptation to turn these stones into bread, well, that's a reasonable temptation if you haven't had anything to eat for 40 days. But it's also a temptation to use your gifts for selfish reasons. And we're sometimes tempted to do that too. But in a deeper sense, I think it was a temptation to Jesus to give people only what they want and not what they need. You know, Jesus did feed thousands of hungry people, but he didn't stop there. He told them that they needed not just bread, but the bread of life. You need my flesh, which is given for the life of the world. And a lot of people said, well, that's crazy talk, and walked away. But that's really what Jesus' mission was. It wasn't just to give them bread. It was to become bread, to sacrifice himself for the world. And that's our mission, too. You know, to be a disciple of Christ involves a whole lot more than just throwing money in the collection. Now, I don't want to demean the collection, it's really important, but there's more than just being charitable. Um, is my life a stronger reflection of Christ? Am I willing to sacrifice 
myself for the good of others. One of the reasons that we're inviting into the desert of 40 days of fasting because we need to look at the things that are keeping us from sacrificing ourselves, those things that we do to just comfort ourselves. Do we need to think less about ourselves and more about others? And then there's the second temptation. Throw yourself down from the temple and let the angels catch you. That's the temptation to success and recognition, to be different, to be special. If Jesus had followed that plan, he would have had lots of fans, but very few disciples, very few followers. And I don't mean Twitter followers, I mean real followers. We don't have hmm? The temptation to think, I'm special and the rules don't apply to me. Well, that's been the downfall of many celebrities, hasn't it? We even have a city built on that idea. We call it Las Vegas. Hmm? What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Well, not really true. It travels with us the rest of our life. What makes us special is not that we have some extraordinary talent or gift. What makes us special is that we're loved by God. And, and this is what Jesus did in his life, was not to treat himself as special, but he totally immersed himself in the human condition. He not only didn't come down from the top of the temple, he didn't come down from the cross, because he knew that if he was going to redeem humanity, he had to become fully human. And remember, the original task of the human community was to take care of the earth. That's what Adam's job was. And so, as followers of the Lord, we can't be indifferent or detached from human suffering and the pain of the world if we're really going to be a follower of Christ. And then the third one is, um, I'll give you all the nations of the world. I can give you power over people. And, and, and um, if you just worship me. And that's a temptation to use the world's power to win the world. And... Um, We've fallen for that many, many times as, as followers of Christ. But the world can only be won by love, not by power. You might say, well, this is a Catholic country or this is a Christian nation. But very often that only means that a Catholic or a Christian is in control. It doesn't mean that the nation or the people are necessarily Catholic or Christian or followers of Christ. And we notice that Jesus never exercised power over people. He did over sin and over demons, but not over people, because Jesus realized that only love can save the world. It's interesting that this gospel has been read on the first Sunday of Lent since way back in the fifth century. I think because it says so much about what Jesus' life and mission was and also about ours. But Lent, as you may know, in the early days, it was really focused on those preparing for baptism. And it was the season in which those of us who were not yet Christian were trying to separate ourselves from the values of the world and to embrace the life and the witness of Christ. And that's still true. Our catechumens and candidates will be uh, attending the rite of continuing conversion and election at the cathedral Sunday afternoon. But it's also, the season of Lent, is also for those of us who have been baptized to recommit ourselves to our true identity and to God's true identity, that God is a God of love. And whatever else happens to us in life, we are still his beloved sons and beloved daughters. And that's our truest and deepest identity. Now, I have something else to talk to you about, and it doesn't have a whole lot to do with the desert or the Garden of Eden, but it concerns a change in the way that we make our Mass available to our online participants. And to do that, I have to go back in history uh, about three years. I, I remember uh, I was driving home from a province council meeting on Friday, March 13th, 20, 
20. And I was listening to the radio, and it was announced that Cardinal Supich has suspended public celebration of Mass at the time for three weeks, effective that Saturday evening, so a day and a half from now. And then one of the auxiliary bishops came on the radio and said that many churches would be live streaming their services this weekend. And I thought and stopped and said, live streaming? What's that? So when I got back to Assumption, I called two people whom I knew would know what live streaming was, and sure enough, they did. And on Sunday morning, we were able to live stream a Mass, all right? And our first effort was a bit primitive, but several hundred people did tune in and watched us either live or, as it would later appear, on our YouTube channel, which had been vastly underutilized in the previous few years that we had it. Well, over the next few weeks, we learned a lot better how to position the camera and to get better sound by recording the audio separately. This took some several hours of editing and, and, uh, in order, and splicing in order to get the video ready for um, broadcast on YouTube and on our website over the weekend. But we recorded the Mass on Thursday and then uploaded it on Saturday afternoon. And all the while, this was considered to be a short-term project, even as the pandemic kept on going. And while other churches began to invest in professional live streaming equipment, we decided to stick with what we were doing because it was going very well. But as more people have returned to church, the number of our viewers on YouTube and Facebook have declined from nearly 400 to 300 to 200, and now for the last year, somewhere around 100. And we could have continued in this way as long as there was a need for this virtual liturgy, except for the fact that as more and more parishes installed live streaming equipment, people began to assume that we had it here. And this became more of an issue at, at, at funerals because family members and, and friends who wanted to participate who were unable to travel or fearful of travel with the pandemic still going on wanted to know, could we, could we live stream the funeral mass? And, and the only thing we could offer was a recording that we could make available uh, several days after the funeral. So last fall, we made the decision to join the ever-increasing number of churches that live stream. Now, due to the infamous supply claim, uh, chain issues, it took about six months for the equipment to arrive. But it's here now, and we've experimented with it for several weeks. And a real positive about waiting until now is that the equipment that we have, it's um, enabled engineers to perfect the product and have also gained a better understanding of what people are looking for when they live stream. So this past week, we had three funerals at Assumption, and two of the families requested live streaming, and we were able to provide a live transmission as well as a recorded version for viewing later. So effective next weekend, the weekend of March 5th, we will be discontinuing our recorded Masses, and we will begin live streaming the 9 o'clock Sunday Mass from Assumption, making it available about an hour later on YouTube. For home viewers, wherever they may be, or wherever you may be, this means that Mass will no longer be available on Saturday afternoon and early on Sunday morning. Mass will take a bit longer because it will no longer be edited for television. But on the positive side, it will feel more like you're actually church again, and viewers will get a chance to hear preachers and presiders other than myself, who've been recording these for the last three years. I hope those of you who are able to come to church um, will at some point decide that I'd like to come back. Lent is a really good time to mark a return to church. 
But for those of you who have physical limitations or health concerns and are unable to come, I hope you'll continue to join us for our live stream mass. And I think it's wonderful to be connected virtually, but a spiritual communion is not the same as receiving the body of Christ. So our blessings continue to go out to all of you, and we look forward to continuing to minister to you, whether in person or online, through our liturgy at Assumption. During this Lent and Easter season, we're invited to pray the Apostles' Creed because at the center of Lent and Easter is the baptism of new members. And so we're going to pray now the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. We place before our compassionate God our needs and the needs of the whole world. For the Church, that we may grow in our relationship with God by frequent reflection on the Word of God and reception of the Bread of Life, we pray to the Lord. For those who struggle with an unhealthy attraction to wealth, power, and control, that God will free their hearts and guide them to a life of faith and trust, we pray to the Lord. For victims of gun violence, that God will heal their physical and emotional wounds, give eternal rest to those who have died, and inspire us with new ways to end violence in society. We pray to the Lord. Lord hear our prayer. For those who must fast every day, and that our Lenten fasting may make us more aware of the homeless, refugees, and those recovering from natural disasters, and touch our hearts to be more generous. We pray to the Lord. For all who are homebound, that they may experience God's presence in their prayer, in their family members, and in visits from members of the faith community, we pray to the Lord. For a deeper respect for the world God created, that we may recognize the land, water, and air as God's gifts to the whole human family, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. God of the deserts and God of high places, see into our hearts. Please grant our prayers, spoken and silent. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Lead kindly light amid the gloom of evening. Lord, lead me on. Lord, lead me my feet I do not ask to see the distant scene one step enough for me so lead me onward Lord and hear my plea
my brothers and sisters that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice at your hands for the praise and glory of God's name, for our good and the good of all his holy church. Give us the right dispositions, O Lord, we pray, to make these offerings, for with them we celebrate the beginning of this venerable and sacred time through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, through Christ our Lord. By abstaining forty long days from earthly food, he consecrated through his fast the pattern of our Lenten observance by overturning all the snares of the ancient serpent, taught us to cast out the leaven of malice, so that celebrating worthily the Paschal mystery, we might pass over at last to the eternal Paschal feast. And so with a company of angels and saints, we sing the hymn of your praise, as without end we acclaim. Holy, holy, Holy Lord, God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You are indeed holy, O Lord, the font of all holiness. Make holy, therefore, these gifts, we pray, by sending down your Spirit upon them like the dewfall, so that they may become for us the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the time he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion, he took bread and, giving thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and once more giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. When we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim your death, O Lord, until you come again. Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life and the chalice of salvation, giving thanks that you have held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. Humbly we pray that partaking of the body and blood of Christ we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. Remember, Lord, your church spread throughout the world and bring her to the fullness of charity, together with Francis, our Pope, and Blaise, our Bishop, and all the clergy and all who minister to your people. Remember also our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection and all who have died in your mercy. Welcome them into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all, we pray, that with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with Blessed Joseph, her spouse, with the Blessed Apostles, and all the saints who have pleased you throughout the ages, we may merit to be co-heirs to eternal life and may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Amen. Amen.
At our Savior's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your spirit. And we share God's gift of peace with the world. Agnus Dei, qui tolis peccata mundi, miserere nobis. Agnus Dei, qui tolis peccata mundi, miserere nobis. Agnus Dei, Qui tolis peccata mundi, dona nobis pacem. O the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, only say the word, and my soul shall be healed. We pray an act of spiritual communion. My Jesus, I believe that you are in the blessed sacrament. I love you above all things, and I long for you in my soul. Since I cannot now receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. As though you have already come, I embrace you and unite myself entirely to you. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen. Jesus, lead the way through our life's long day. When at times the way is cheerless, help us follow calm and fearless. Guide us by your hand to the promised land. Jesus, be our light in the midst of night. Let not faithless fear o'ertake us. Let not faith and hope forsake us. May we feel you near as we worship here. Let us pray. A bountiful blessing, O Lord, we pray, come down upon your people, that hope may grow in tribulation, virtue be strengthened in temptation, and eternal redemption be assured through Christ our Lord. Amen. Those of you who are joining us next week, remember the live stream is available about 9 o'clock, and then about 11 o'clock you can watch the rebroadcast as many times as you want. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace, glorifying the Lord by your life. Thanks be to God. Again we keep this solemn fast, a gift of faith from ages past. This land which binds us lovingly to faith and hope and charity.